What's up guys, how are we today? You can't answer that, but actually, you know what, you can. Leave me a comment, how are you today? Let me know. Today we're gonna be doing a video that's a little bit different in terms of I've written no script. I have a few dot points, which are in here somewhere. I'm just gonna be talking off the cuff. It's a little bit of a risk because we know that I tend to monologue. The topic of today's five days video is 10 tips on how to, what is that? The topic of today's five days video is 10 tips to healthier relationships. And I trusted my ability to speak off the cuff about this because it's a topic about which I'm very passionate. And guess what? It's relevant to literally all of you because relationships are a thing. We are relational beings. And I truly believe that in order to live a fully healthy, happy, fulfilled life, we need to have good, flourishing, healthy relationships with people who love us and people who we are free to love in return. And remember, it's not the mountains that we conquer, but ourselves. Please don't click off the video. Now, I am by no means some relationship guru. I am just a gal who loves relationships. I mean, I've had my share of relationships in this life, friendships, family relationships, romantic relationships, work relationships, salesperson, customer relationships, kidnapper, kidnappee relationships. I'm just kidding, don't click off the video. And I've really learned a lot in that time about what contributes to healthy relationships versus what destroys relationships. And as a result, I've compiled a list. It was gonna be five, but when I started writing, I realized that I had much more than five tips for having healthy relationships. So with that said, let's dive straight in. You're gonna wanna hang around till the end because the last tip that I've got is what I believe is the most important one. So tip number one, if someone's annoyed you or hurt you, sleep on it before you bring it up with them. This is something that I've learned the hard way. As an F, I tend to get quite emotional on the spot when someone's hurt or annoyed me. I naturally want to lash out in some way. That, in my young years, ended up in me saying things that I really didn't mean that ended up hurting the person or making the situation worse. Now, I do believe that in a good, healthy relationship, there should be room for error like that because we're all imperfect humans. We're all gonna make mistakes, right? So if you do end up hurting someone, lashing out, saying things that you don't mean, if you're in a healthy relationship, there'll be room for apology afterwards. I do believe that what matters more than what's said in the fight or the disagreement itself is how the pair comes to reconciliation. Yeah, if someone has said something that's hurt you, a lot of the time it'll feel like a bigger deal than it actually is in the moment and vocalizing it in the moment might actually do more harm than good to the relationship. So sleeping on it is a really good way to do discern how you really feel about it. And if it's something that's still bothering you the next day, you can bring it up then when you've had time to process, when your emotions have had time to calm down. It's also a really good way to practice self-discipline in terms of not bringing up every little thing that hurts you, putting the other before yourself so that you're not just bringing up all these little nitpicky things. That's not to say you should suppress them. If there's an issue that's bothering you, you should always bring it up. But sometimes when we're in those arguments and we get hurt or annoyed, we can misunderstand something that the person has said as being more hurtful than it actually is to us. Things seem really escalated in the moment. This applies to you if you have a lower F function as well. You're probably relating to what I say because I'm human, right? So it's a good idea to just sleep on it or even just go away for a couple of hours, think about it, discern it, meditate on it, and then come back and work out, is this something that's really worth bringing up? Again, if you're hurt in the moment and you bring it up, you should be able to feel free to do that. As long as you're practicing love, bringing it up in like a charitable way, not a blamey way. If you have a good grasp on healthy communication, it shouldn't really matter at the end of the day, but I found certainly in my life that this is a good tip, especially for those really emotional people who feel things quite strongly. Tip number two, be open to criticism. Reality is that we as people are viewing ourselves with biased, glasses. The way we perceive ourselves is very different from how others perceive us most of the time. And those people who are our nearest and dearest, who have grown up with us or spent lots of time with us, probably know our flaws maybe more than we do. The vices that we're prone to, those little things that get in the way of our ability to see things clearly or love people on the daily. And as humans, we have a tendency to justify, mentally justify our own vices. If we do something wrong, we'll kind of jump into the camp of, oh, but the person, you know, asked for it, or the person was the one who was really doing something wrong. That other person made me feel this way, so I had a right to lash out the way I did, or whatever it is, whatever vice we're talking about. The reality is that we have to acknowledge we cannot see ourselves 100% clearly. And the people in our life who love us and want us around, especially people like family, childhood friends, 
they are the ones who know us really well. So if they bring up a vice of yours, provided that you know that they're doing so in charity, willing your good, listen to them. There's probably something to what they're saying. Recently, at the beginning of this year, I was going through something hard and I was trying to wrestle with some things within me to work out why I was feeling a type of way that I was, why I was resorting to certain coping mechanisms to deal with whatever I was feeling. And one of my friends who's very close, she's been living with me for a long time, she's known me for years, she pointed out to me a particular flaw of mine that was really hard for me to swallow and that I honestly had been completely blind to and I didn't know that it was a weakness of mine. And when she said it, my natural response as like this stubborn, proud, choleric type was like, no, you're wrong. You've just misperceived things. But then I went away and I was like, oh man, there was something about the situation that made me go, there's truth to what she said. Because you know how I knew that? I was like, she knows me really well, better than most people. I know that she loves me and that she wills my good. She's proven that to me so many times. She wouldn't just say this if it was nothing, if there was no grounds to it. So I then had to wrestle with the fact that this was a vice of mine that I wasn't aware was a vice. And I had two options, either lie to myself and deny that it was a thing and like resent her deep down for that, or accept that there's probably truth to it and start to work on that vice. Even though I'm super into self-development, I obviously chose the second one, even though it was really hard to do so. But it was really fruitful for me because it was like someone pointing out a blind spot that I wasn't aware I had, and then going on further from that. It was something I was able to take into consideration when there was something a bit off in how I was perceiving something. I was able to be like, oh right, well this is a weakness I'm aware that I have. And then being aware of that weakness, I was able to work on it and now I can say that it's improved, that weakness, that vice of mine. Most people who love you are just gonna want you to be living a better life and improving yourself and being a better person. So that's why this tip is like life-changing. Listen to the people close to you. If they're bringing something up for your own good, there's probably an element of truth to it. If you hear someone tell you one of your vices, don't then go seek the counsel of some other friend who you know is gonna validate your experience rather than tell you the truth. Like I could have gone to one of my other friends who maybe we're less close and we're kind of just, our friendship exists on the premise of we just sort of have a good time together. And I know I probably could have got validation of, oh no, your friend's wrong, like you're fine. And I think that's something I definitely did a lot when I was younger. But you're not like improving yourself. You're not improving those weak cracks in your personality, which are normal, yes but it's good to be aware of them. And that's just not fun, is it? I don't know why I even have this tea. I'm not drinking it. Listen to the constructive criticism from the people who love you and will your good. Number three, assume that the other person is operating with different tools than you are when it comes to perceiving and judging things. I think a lot of the time there are subliminal expectations that we have on someone based on how we perceive situations and how we think and reflect on situations. And we naturally assume everyone is just operating with the same tools as us in that circumstance. So this might end up in miscommunications between people where party A is like, how did you not know that this is what I meant when I said this? And party B is like, how could I know that? Like I was just taking your words on face value. Or how could you not have realized that what I really wanted you to do when I felt sick was come on over with some flowers and bring me soup? Or, you know, how did you not know that on our first date I was expecting you to pay or take me to some really fancy restaurant or how did you not know that I wanted you to throw me a surprise party for my birthday? Those are just some examples off the top of my head. But basically there are so many situations where arguments, disagreements happen when they don't need to purely based on the fact that one person is using different tools from the other in terms of perceiving and judging. And that's where Myers Briggs comes in so feel free to check out the rest of the channel if you're interested. Once you start to realize that you guys are using different tools in this area you're able to extend so much more grace to the person. You're able to be like, oh, that person seems to have misunderstood what I said. Maybe I wasn't clear enough. Or, oh, this person seems to have missed this really important point of what I said or what I did. Maybe I should sit down and have a chat with them and explain to them what I really meant when I said this thing or whatever it is, I'm being so vague. So differences in these perceiving and judging tools can mean that 
both parties are understanding and reading a situation completely differently. You might not be understanding each other's thought patterns. You might not be understanding each other's mode of processing emotions. You might be jumping to completely different conclusions. One of you might be using really emotional language, whereas the other one is using more rational language. And that can cause so many misunderstandings. So generally speaking, even if you're not into MBTI or you don't understand the cognitive functions or whatever it is, just generally approach situations, disagreements, arguments, or just a regular day with a person you love and you know loves you and wills your good, extending them the grace of they're probably perceiving things and judging things differently to how I am. When you start to approach things with that mentality, you generally are likely to get way less triggered and you're probably gonna be more compassionate and understanding than you would if you kind of were just existing in this state of everyone's using the same tools as I am, so everyone's drawing the same conclusions as I am, etc., etc. Tip number four, actively work on lowering your expectations of the other person. For the same reason as what I just said, we're approaching situations with different tools. Certain expectations you have of people as a result are just probably going to be based on ideals or rules that you subconsciously have that the other person just isn't even considering or working with. I found in my experience that a lot of relationship failure comes from hidden expectations that I'm not even aware that I have of the person. So things like, how could they not have texted me about this thing that happened in my life? Or how have my friends not known to check up on me when I am sick? Or how did my friend not know to buy me a birthday cake on my birthday when I live overseas and I don't have a family to buy me a birthday cake? Surely she knows that I'd be feeling lonely today. That's a very specific example. <laughs> you know who you are. Things like this, like little things, not just big things. Expectations that we're placing on people that are just based on these random things, whether it's to do with our upbringing or our ideals about the world or how we believe love should be based on the Hallmark cards or the chick flicks that we watched when we were young. These expectations are not fun for anyone. Granted, of course you should have basic expectations of like loyalty and honesty and respecting the equality of dignity and justice in the relationship. Expecting that you will be treated like a human being is fair. But I mean those other things. If there's a miscommunication, I've found that it's a good idea to sort of look in the mirror and turn that back on myself and ask, hmm, how could this miscommunication or this pain or hurt that I feel be coming from some subconscious expectation that I have of this person or that I have of relationships. And from there, with that self-awareness, you're able to ask yourself, is that a fair expectation to have? Oh, well, if this person didn't know that I had that expectation or they don't have the same expectation, of course they weren't even, it wasn't even gonna cross their mind to buy me a birthday cake. <laughs> One of the greatest things that I've learned is that relationships thrive in freedom. When both parties are free to give their love, freely and truly, without feeling trapped in any way, without feeling like they're obligated to give their love, without feeling like there'll be consequences if they don't give their love in certain ways. One of the greatest paradoxes of being a human is that we crave independence and autonomy, but that we crave relationship and companionship as well. But you can only have both in a healthy way when both parties in the relationship give each other the freedom and autonomy to love freely. And then ironically, in that freedom and autonomy, we as humans will want to love and give everything to the person that we love, self-sacrifice to the person that we love. So for relationships to thrive, thrive. Relationships to thrive, in my experience, each person needs to choose love freely. Each person needs to be given the freedom by the other person to choose the good. If you live in a household where you have been such a stickler for rules and you've given so many rules about exactly the way the dishwasher needs to be packed, exactly the way the dishes need to be washed, exactly the way the house needs to be cleaned or vacuumed, you're not leaving enough space for people to be able to choose to do it of their own free will in love. Because the expectations are so clear, you're expected to do all these things in the house. So where's the room for the person to choose in freedom to do those things. There is no room. In fact, if the person now does those things perfectly, it will no longer be a sense of, oh, I'm so thankful that you did those things. It'll be like, yeah, well, of course you did. That was the expectation and you just met the expectation. You've just done the bare minimum. Whereas if you live in a household 
where there are less rules. This is just an analogy that I have, an example. And I found this in the house that I live in. We don't really have a lot of rules amongst us in this house, but the household really functions well because each of the girls in the house are doing things behind the scenes that play into their strengths. For instance, I frequently forget to take out the bins just because of who I am as a person. And I don't always remember to vacuum just because I don't notice as quickly as someone else does when things get dirty. So I don't even think to vacuum, but I know that other girls in the house are really good at that. And so I know that girls are vacuuming and taking the bins out more than I am, but they're not ever complaining about it. They're just doing it in love. And I know that they're doing it behind the scenes in a self-sacrificial manner. And so that then makes me, when I see dishes built up in the kitchen, even if they're not my dishes, it makes me joyfully be able to choose to do the dishes for everyone because I'm like, well, I know that they're doing all these things behind the scenes to love me and to contribute to the household. So it is an absolute joy for me to clean up after them in the ways that I do notice and the ways that I do care about the ways that I am good at. And so this is just an example of how relationships can thrive when trust and autonomy and freedom are given to each other. Tip number, yeah, tip number five. Listen to the person's needs. I mean, this is something that's been talked about to death. You have the things like the five love languages in order to be able to understand how your loved one best feels loved. That's certainly something that's good to look into. This kind of plays into the cognitive functions a little bit in terms of, you know, as an SE Dom, I have certain needs. For example, I need to go out and explore and have variety in my sense data that some other types won't need. In the same way, the people who I find love me the best are people who understand that about myself. Like Marie, my ENTJ housemate, literally last night, I was having a bit of a, a hard night and there was some stress factors and all that. And I sort of was a bit down and she said, let's go do something SE. Let's get in the car, go for a drive. Let's go to Pancakes on the Rocks. Let's go have a pray in the church. Cause she knew that I needed to be out. It wasn't just necessarily enough for me to sit and talk. She suggested, you know, watching a TV show, I was like, no, that's not gonna do it. She's like, let's go, let's, let's go take a drive. And we did, and it was great. And I went to bed feeling so loved. It was awesome. People have different ways of getting their energy. People have different needs in terms of how they feel loved and how they feel heard. And it's important to listen to that and don't even hesitate to bring up conversations about that. Some of the times that I felt the most loved is when I'm talking to someone who doesn't necessarily know how to emotionally validate me in the moment, but they'll say something like, what do you need from me right now? Or what can I do to make this easier for you? And I always feel really loved by that because I'm like, this person's not necessarily a natural at emotional validation, but the point is that they want to be here for me and they, they want to do something. They want to make me feel loved. And that's the intention that counts, right? One thing that can often happen in any kind of relationship is that we hope the person will kind of like pick up on our needs at some point, even though we've never like voiced them. But I've certainly found that you can save a lot of time and stress and pain sometimes by just communicating and just saying, these are my needs. This is what I need from you. What do you need from me? Etc. Etc. By the way, please feel free to leave any anecdotes that you can think of down down in the comments in regards to any of these points. I would love to know your thoughts. Tip number six. That's not a six, Kristen. <laughs> Tip number six, choose to be vulnerable. Vulnerability is really hard, but it is hands down one of the greatest things on the planet in terms of relationship building. This is something I've only learned in the last two years, but it's been life changing. And I did a whole video on vulnerability it's up here if you'd like to have a watch. Basically, the important point is that vulnerability is really hard, but in vulnerability, not only does it help us by being humble, but it also allows the other person to love us, which is how relationships are strengthened. A lot of us think we can kind of get by in relationships by appearing stronger than we are and appearing like the one who doesn't need help so that we can be there for others. But in order for relationships to grow, we need to be there for each other. We need to lean on each other. And through suffering and vulnerability, we're able to let that person in. We're able to say, I need and want to lean on you. Please let me lean on you. That allows the other person to love you truly and really well. Granted, it's really hard to be vulnerable and it shouldn't be something that you just do with everyone. But it's just one of the sweetest, most beautiful things. And what I have found is that if you're vulnerable, the person is much more likely to be vulnerable to you in return and therefore you're able to love them in return, which is just like the best thing ever. Like it's what life is about. When you start to bring this this element into your relationships, it's like, oh, it's so fulfilling and life giving. I can't even. 
So yeah, watch that video if you're interested. Lesson number seven, say sorry. I also did a video about this, the power of apology, which you can watch up here. Saying I'm sorry is one of the most powerful things you can do. It can bring immense healing. As I said earlier in the video, I found that it doesn't matter how crazy you get in an argument, if the reconciliation at the end of it or the next day or whenever is genuine and beautiful, it can not only take away the pain from the previous fight, but it can genuinely just bring you so much closer. Because again, you're being vulnerable in that apology. All of these tips kind of like merge together. In an apology, we are ultimately being vulnerable as well. And so you're letting a person love you in that moment and see you humbling yourself, you self-sacrificing for the other person, which is just so beautiful. Just say sorry. Look in the mirror, look inside yourself, and be like, hey, I'm a human being. I also do things wrong. It's not just always someone else's fault. It can be my fault too. In that humility, you kind of start to realize where you're going wrong, where you could be hurting people. Just say sorry. Tip number eight, say thank you. Thank you is also super important when someone's gone out of their way to do something for you, even if it is some of the things we talked about, like if they say sorry to you, that's worth thanking them for. If they ask you about your needs, that's worth thanking them for. If they extend grace to you in any capacity, that's worth thanking them for. It's just worth thanking someone for loving you well or for trying to love you well. In this world, it's not easy to do. So thank you goes a long way. Number nine, put your phone away. Phones are designed to ruin the human experience. No, that's too dramatic. They are designed to ruin human relationships. That's also really dramatic, but they can, they can ruin human relationships. The amount of times we spend scrolling our phones, answering text messages, whatever it is, like, don't get me wrong. It's important to answer text messages and to, you know, be on your phone for work things or, you know, for a bit of downtime or whatever. But if you're with someone who you love, what kind of message are you giving to them? If when they're trying to talk to you or be with you, you are looking at your phone instead. Granted, I guess if you're married to someone or you are spending a lot of time with someone, if you live together with someone like me and my housemates will often sit in the same room and just be on our phones for a bit of downtime because we like just being in each other's presence. But we see each other like all the time. So it's like you're doing all the mundane things of your life together. What I'm talking about is when you have intentional time with the person that you love, a person you're in relationship with, what kind of message is it giving if you're looking at your phone during that time? You're saying whatever is on my phone, which is in the virtual world, is more important than the reality that is in front of me, spoken like a true essay, of you. You are the person who made time for me today. You should get my full attention, but you're not getting my full attention. I'm instead paying attention to the virtual world. This especially applies to like, if you've got a coffee date with someone or a, a lunch date with someone, like a friend, and they've taken the time out of the day to be with you and you're just like on your phone. Or even if you have your phone facing up and then a notification goes off and you're going from like looking at them intently to suddenly like, looking at your notification to see what the notification said. I cannot tell you how many times I've died inside when I'm with someone and that happens. The moment I see their eyes flick down, I've just started calling people out on it now. Admittedly, do it somewhat passive aggressively sometimes. I'm like, oh, is that person more important than me, are they? We know that actions speak louder than words sometimes. And I just think the action of spending intentional time with someone and not looking at your phone speaks volumes about how important they are to you. In fact, one of the most beautiful things is when I go to a lunch date with one of my friends and I see that they don't even have their phone on the table. One of my friends who I super appreciate that he does this, he just doesn't even bring his phone into the house if he comes over or he like leaves it at the front door, leaves it in a location where he's not even gonna be tempted to look at it. And I'm like, this is great. Now we get time, just us at this board game night or whatever it is, just completely immersed in the moment, giving face time to each other listening to each other, not worrying about what's going on in our phone. And that friend actually inspired me to do so myself. So now I, for select things, will leave my phone in the car. Cause I think it just sends a really nice message to the person that I'm with, you know? Like, I, I know it's the culture. Like why have we got to a point where we crave the dopamine or we love the dopamine that much that when we're physically with someone who's giving us their time out of their day, they've made a plan to come see us the notification from someone who sent us something from the comfort of their own home or five seconds out of their day takes priority that we have to look at it. Am I missing something? Let me know if I'm missing something, guys. There's so many F, like mini FI rants in this video. Nah, look, don't get me wrong. I understand this culture, phones, etc. 
general disclaimers here about how we can't be blamed to a certain point because our culpability goes down because of having been brainwashed by the culture, yada yada yada. Disclaimer, disclaimer, I understand you. Validation. So that brings us to point number 10, guys, which is work on yourself. And that's the most important tip. And it's the tip that encompasses all of the other tips that I've given, because if you are working on yourself, you're going to be attuned to all these other things that you're aware you need to work on or pay attention to in relationships. Working on yourself, whether that be through therapy, meditation, prayer, journaling, going to those anger venting outlets where you like smash plates against walls. This is what counts because in working on yourself, you're actually saying that you're open to learning faults about yourself, weaknesses about yourself, and therefore you're just going to be more humble and more able to accept those really hard truths about yourself that come up when you do the hard work of therapy. And let me tell you, therapy in whatever way that it takes form, is hard. Oh, it's hard. There's so many subconscious things that come up that you weren't even aware were getting in your way of perceiving things or relationships or whatever. And it's tempting to just give up and just be like, ah, I'm just gonna be a mediocre person. But no, we do not love being a mediocre person. And especially when you start to do it and you start to realize the things, it can be a lot, like a lot. It can like keep you up at night. It can make you feel so overwhelmed that you don't know how to handle anything in your life. But once you do the hard first few months or however long, the amount of positive days in comparison to the negative days is like astronomically bigger. Did that make sense? Because in working on yourself, going to therapy, doing the hard work, you're ultimately working towards being happy with yourself, with loving yourself, and most importantly, respecting yourself. When you respect yourself, you are going to naturally give that energy off to other people that you are someone worthy of being respected you're going to settle for less maltreatment and you're going to start treating people with the respect that they deserve as well also working on yourself means that because you're making more peace with what's going on within you you therefore need to spend less time thinking about you and instead that's extra energy, mental and emotional energy that you can give to others instead. And therefore you can love better. I heard an analogy recently that before you go to therapy, your mind is like a garbage bin with all of these bits of garbage that have been building up your entire life, but they're like all crumpled and chucked in. And going to therapy is like the grueling process of taking out each piece of rubbish one by one, folding them and then neatly packing them back in from the bottom up. Therefore, not only making sense of them and archiving them properly, but freeing up so much more space in the bin. Hold oh, the bin. You're a bin. <laughs> For other things. Mental energy, emotional energy that you can give to other people and other things in your life. And I really like that analogy because in making sense and making peace with so many of the things from our past that never necessarily made sense to us, whether it be like mentalities we had, coping mechanisms we had, defense mechanisms we had, ways that we lash out that we weren't even aware, aware we were doing it. Making sense of all that stuff just brings interior peace and interior respect and interior discipline and interior like self-mastery really. And after you do that, your interior strength is so much stronger. <laughs> Non-scripted. Your strength is stronger. Your interior strength is so much more real that you just feel sorry for yourself less. You start wishing that things were different less. You start thinking the grass is always green on the other side less and you're therefore happier. And so you can give that energy to other people and love other people better because your mind is less frazzled and so you can truly be present. Whatever that looks like, it doesn't even have to be in an SE way. Present, whatever that looks like for you. You can do it if you've done the work on yourself. Obviously speaking very generally, although everything that I said in this video is stuff that I really believe and all of these tips since I've started using them in relationships have just made me a happier person, a more peaceful person, a person who respects myself more, a person who has greater self-discipline, my ability to self-sacrifice, be more humble, like all these things have increased just by thinking about these things. But ultimately it comes down to self-work, willingness to do the work, openness to being wrong, all of the things we touched on in this video. So with that being said, guys, I've definitely spoken enough and of course, I didn't finish my tea or even really touch my tea if I'm honest and it's cold now, but who's surprised? I don't even know why I make tea before videos, why? So I hope you got something out of this video. Please let me know in the comments your own experience or thoughts on the things that I've touched on. Relationships are really beautiful. They're just everything. They're what life is about. The sooner you come to realize that and accept that, the greater your life 
will be. And I know it can be hard to make the change and start to implement these things in your life, but you can either choose the hard route today and start doing the work or leave it and continue to age and then a year from now, you might decide it's time to start doing the work. But if you start today, you could be a year ahead in a year's time. So <laughs> that's logic that made sense. Oh, one more thing, classic. I've just released my website. It's a place you can go to visit if you would like to see where all my projects are located. But I've just put a feature on there where on the contact me page, you can submit a question that you have about, about typology, about personality theory, or you could even just tell me a story about your life or a circumstance about your life and ask for my advice. And I will be reading out those questions on periodic episodes on my podcast that I will title Dear Kristen, because it's like you're writing to me. Anyway, you can write those questions on the contact section of the page and your question will be featured in one of the Dear Kristen podcast episodes where I will read it aloud and then talk through solutions to it or talk through my answer to it. So visit the website if you're interested, hellodearkristen.com and jump onto the contact section of the page if you'd like to ask me a question. Great, now that that is out of the way, I'll chat to you guys later. Thanks for sticking around and have a beautiful day. Bye.